Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. When I was 14 years old, my parents played a dirty trick on me. They moved me and our family from our suburban home in Omaha, Nebraska, population half a million people, to the small Wisconsin town of New London, population 6,000. My father was from the area originally, and for him, it was a chance to move back home. For me, and just entering into high school, it was the biggest upheaval of my life. The first day I attended school, I wore what every proud Nebraska boy would wear. Corduroy pants, collar shirt, and some nicely polished cowboy boots. Turns out that's not acceptable attire for your typical Wisconsin youth of the mid-1980s. For the next four years, I carried around the nickname, which I still carry today, J.R., based on the character from the popular CBS television series Dallas, and also my, my initials. That was my first introduction to something sociologists call culture shock. A culture shock is something that every person will face in their life if they ever live more than a hundred miles from the place where they were born, to varying degrees, of course. You can isolate yourself from the differences and cultures that you encounter. But I have uh, experienced culture shock multiple times in my life. Every time I've moved to a different part of the world, I've had to adapt, had been confronted with the reality that people don't think and talk and look or smell the same everywhere in the world. So one of the biggest aspects of, of culture, one of the most important markers of any culture, and one of the things which marks you as an insider or an outsider is language. Again, uh, growing up in uh, Nebraska, I had experienced a little bit with the, the peculiar dialect of English spoken in northeastern Wisconsin, uh, one which I unfortunately or fortunately have uh, assimilated into my own vocabulary so that whenever people meet me today, they say, are you from Canada? But that was something that I had uh, experienced as a, as a young child making our trips from Nebraska to Wisconsin and listening to my cousins speak. I wondered, what kind of people are these? <laughs> And of course, when you, when you encounter something different, your, your thoughts naturally turn to, well, they, I am superior than they are because I would never, ever do things that way. And, and not just with language, but with uh, so many other things, not just with fashion choices or choices of music or food, but culture in so many ways unites large groups of people, but it also divides them into different segments or, or tribes, if you will. And language is certainly one of those key markers, one of those things which is unavoidable because we all need to talk in order to communicate with each other. So let me tell you a little bit about moving to a country where they don't speak English. They don't speak a dialect that you can recognize of English, a place where you have to learn a completely different way of of talking and different words, different grammar, different way of putting things together. Now, of course, as Americans, we have the advantage that uh, we already speak English, the language which is spoken the most throughout the world. So it's very possible for you to go to another country and speak English and get by with that. You can always find somebody there who will know enough English for you to get your point across, or you can find somebody that can help you, you translate. And so 
that is an advantage that we have, but it also is, it works against us as well as language learners, because it's just that much easier not to put the effort into learning to speak the local lingo. And over the years, I've, you know, seen a variety of expats in a variety of situations, <clears throat> different countries. And, and usually you come into one of two positions. Either you come across the person who really dives deep into the language and after many years of, of speaking it, knows it inside and out. And then it seems like on the other side, there are people who never really get past the, the first level of knowledge, the, 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 the level of uh, exchanging greetings. And, and they're good with that. So either you go completely head over heels into learning the language or you just kind of skip it. That's at least what I thought. I think I've got a little more wisdom and perspective on that since. I, I think that um, when you live any extended period of time among other people, you are going to learn aspects of their language. You may learn more or less. You may be, feel comfortable speaking it more or not so much, but you will keep picking it up. And I'm also fully convinced that, that no matter how much uh, of a person's language or culture you learn, you'll never fully understand where they're coming from because language is only the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It's the, it's just the, the key that gets you into the door. Well, if you're uh, in that category of uh, people who is committed to studying a foreign language, the, the people that you live among, then I would quote uh, Jedi Master Yoda, <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. There, there really isn't any halfway position where you're going to just learn a few phrases here or there, and then you're good. You're either going to jump in with both feet into the culture and and uh, and make a fool of yourself as you stumble around trying out different phrases, combinations of grammar, or you'll probably just end up being a spectator sitting on the sidelines, getting by with English and, and translators. And again, language learning is, is only a part of connecting with the people and their culture, but it is absolutely a big part. And not being able to communicate with people in their language, that is a huge part of culture shock. And maybe I should have uh, spent a few minutes at the front of this piece talking about what is this phenomenon of, of culture shock that I'm talking about. Culture shock is when you arrive in a new place in the very beginning, you're excited to be there, you're pumped up, you've been looking forward to this for a long time, you want to drink in everything, the way that the people are dressed, the the streets, the way they're laid out, uh, the flow of traffic through the city, the kind of foods that they're eating, just so many, so many different things. It's overwhelming and it's exciting and exhilarating for maybe about the first two to three days, maybe a week if you're really adventurous. And then after that, the reality sets in. I really did this. I really moved to a foreign country and I'm going to be here for a while. I'm not going home at the end of this vacation. That's when the shock kicks in. And it can be rough. And it manifests itself in lots of different ways. You could have a person who is uh, so homesick that they just stay at home inside their apartment all day long, uh, binge-watching Netflix dramas, or just going out to eat at uh, familiar Western restaurants, it's amazing where McDonald's has restaurants in the world, isn't it? And this uh, feeling of wanting to find things that are familiar and comfortable really come as a reaction against the feeling of, I don't belong here, I'm not part of these people, I don't understand them. You're just looking for something to help numb the pain, perhaps, I don't know. And it can get so bad that, that people eventually leave, go back home where they came from. But I think that's the minority. I think majority of uh, Americans and other expats who leave their home country, they do make a significant effort to to try and overcome those feelings of alienation and not belonging and and learning the language, learning to speak with natives in their tongue, even if they can speak English with you. 
that goes a long ways to helping break down some of those barriers, some of those feelings of being other. Now, there are lots of uh, theories about language learning. I'm certainly not an expert in linguistics. I have learned to, uh, to speak fluently two spoken languages in addition to English. I can read several other languages as well. I can I can tell you that uh, there are people who you w- who did excellent in studying a language in school, and then when they actually end up in a in a country and have to use it, they don't perform. There are lots of reasons for that. I think a big part of it is the gifts that you were born with, and that includes not only your ability to learn and memorize things, but also your personality, because definitely extroverts have an advantage over introverts in this particular uh, aspect of learning. I think there are a lot of detours and distractions along the way. I think anybody, if they had enough time, or if they should say if they didn't have those distractions, they could probably become fluent, at least enough, in a language to feel like they could hold their own in a conversation. But like I said, there are lots of detours and distractions. You get so busy at the beginning of your stay in a foreign country with your work or setting up your house that, you know, you, you don't have that time. You don't make that time to to study the language. And, and I think eventually you you just learn how to cope without it. Fact is, there are lots of ways to learn a language and none of them are easy. There's the uh, the LAMP method, which is a method based on uh, a book that was written by uh, Dr. Webster uh, many, many years ago. He and his wife were Christian missionaries. Their approach is uh, to just look, begin by learning phrases that uh, are based on a, on a script. The first month you have in a country, every day there's a new script to learn. You memorize the script, you get out and practice that with as many people as you can, so while you're learning things about the language, you're also forming bonds with people as well. That's a very excellent method for picking up any language. Highly recommended. But it's not everybody's cup of tea because it does require you to be pretty willing to to put yourself out there. And it presumes that you're in a safe environment too. Not every culture is, is, is welcoming to foreigners trying to learn to speak their language. There are other methods to learn a language. I have, my wife have found very helpful to to do uh, the, the language drill method where you get to learn how, an aspect of grammar and you drill it and drill it over and over again. And then you, you go and you use it in person. So it's kind of a, a modified approach to the LAMP method. It's tedious, repeating grammar drills over and over again, but it's like learning to play the scales uh, on a musical instrument. Uh, eventually, you know, you, you get to the point where you, you understand the value of that. It's foundational. You, you, you have to know the grammar. You have to know the rules of, a, of how a language operates, like it or not. It's just a question of how much uh, do you need to know. And I would say you need a little bit at first, and you need to use it a lot. And, you know, one of the reasons, too, for language study being so difficult because it, it's a, there's a biological change that's taking place inside of your brain. Your neurons are growing new connections inside your head. And of course, in my particular case, I have, I've noticed that they grow a lot slower at the half century mark than, than they did when I was at the quarter century mark. As I've said, you know, there's a, a huge social aspect to picking up a foreign language. It definitely uh, works to your favor if you're extroverted, loudmouthed, <laughs> and uh, not conscious of yourself, even to the point where you may be putting yourself in danger <laughs> at some points. You, you definitely have to get outside of your comfort zone because, you know, you're constantly making mistakes, mixing up the words for come and go, bring and take, or flowers, and prison. It's extremely humbling to learn a foreign language. I sat at the feet of a Malawian woman and basically spoke baby talk with her for about an hour. I I give her kudos for putting up with me for that long. Most people aren't that patient. Again, I think uh, if I was an immigrant to Malawi and I didn't know English, if I came from some other part of the world... I think I'd, I'd have a lot more motivation to try and learn 
the local lingo because there wouldn't be any second option. But as American expats living here, we we have a lot more independence than somebody who would be an immigrant. We are financially self-reliant, right? I don't need to go on the street and sell tomatoes or cucumbers in order to survive. But that, again, puts up just an additional barrier to me coming into contact with this culture. Another uh, observation that's important to make about culture shock and, and learning a language is that you really have a very small window of time to form a bond with the local culture to the point where, yeah, in the first week, if you haven't started to practice learning the language, you probably won't get that deep into it. But it's hard because you get distracted so easily, setting up your house, looking for places to find food that you recognize, learning how to drive on the left side of the road, which here, in this case, is the right side, getting connected to the internet, right? Who knew how difficult it would be, how many papers you'd have to fill out, how long you'd have to stand in line, dealing with dirt and insects. You get distracted because you, you're you constantly casting a look over your shoulder back at what you left behind instead of looking at what's right there in front of you, or you focus on completing whatever task it is that you have at hand, right? You gotta get that new outlet installed in your in your kitchen because it's so much easier to check off a list rather than uh, the task of uh, building relationships with other people, which is a, which is a task that never gets finished ever. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight said, My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And I think about uh, language learning as a all-or-nothing task. You could say the same thing about Jesus saving the world. You know, he was all in, right? There was no halfway for him. He set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem in the final months of his life. And not even his closest friends could distract him from offering himself up for the sins of the world. He was dialed in 100%. And, and that really is my comfort as I look at myself and I consider my own lack of full commitment to God, and to the mission that he's given me, whether it's come to a country and learn their language or to share the love and the, salva- the message of salvation that he has earned. So I need to ask God to demolish my sinful pride, the obstacles to, to being a learner. I need to be made even more aware that this is his work. It's not mine. And that his labor is never in vain, even if I can't always see the point of it. I thank God for the example of my colleagues who have been here for long, long time. They demonstrate love for the people and the culture of Malawi. And I ask God to make the use of my time here as as he sees fit. Not my list of to-dos, but but his list, so that his son may be glorified among the people of this country. Another uh, aspect of or contributing factor to culture shock is the expectations that you bring when you come to a new place. 26 years ago, I arrived in the country of Bulgaria. It was my very first time abroad, and it was my first assignment into the gospel ministry. The collapse of the Soviet economic system triggered vast, vast political and societal upheaval throughout the Eastern Bloc. It created huge fortunes for a small minority of people, but misery and hardship for the majority. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I had heard about the, quote, hunger for the gospel in former communist countries. You want to know what expectations I brought with me. I was expecting a new Pentecost, right? Thousands of people coming to to Christ. Well, it didn't take long to pop that bubble. The very first day I was in the country, a local asked me what I was doing there. Uh, I'm a missionary. A missionary? We don't need missionaries. This is a Christian country. It was a <laughs> rude awakening to me, to the reality that American missionaries didn't really have a place 
in that culture at that time. You know, expats uh, come to countries for various reasons. Maybe they come to give advice to the government or to help with NGO charity work. Or maybe they come to spy for the CIA. <laughs> but missionary work? Cyril and Methodius took care of that for Bulgaria back in the 9th century. I'm a Lutheran missionary, right? And I tell people that and they would say, what cult is that? Because the, the local flavor of religion was Eastern Orthodoxy. Fast forward to the year 2017. I arrive in a country where Protestant missionaries definitely have a place. There's a space that has been created and it's understood what missionaries do. And very, and they have very definite expectations of what I can do for them. Now, my very first uh, official assignment that was given to me by the leadership of the local church here was to deliver a paper at a synod convention on the role of the missionary. It's a question that many people have asked and still are asking today. In colonial times, missionaries often served as proxies for the colonial administrations. They've been accused of practicing cultural genocide, wiping away the local beliefs and customs and replacing them with their European Christian ones. Why would they ask the newbie missionary to give a paper on the role of the missionary? It's all right. I gave it a try. I gave it a try because who knows, maybe, maybe I can see something that others are missing. So I gave the paper. I don't know that I changed anybody's understanding of what missionaries do or their expectations, but I definitely learned a lot from that exercise. I got to see the development of the history of the mission here in Malawi and also see where we still have a ways to go. But I need to keep my expectations on a very short leash. You know, this this is not the United States of America, duh. <laughs> and people who expect that they're going to find things in another country the same way they were back home are, are frankly just not thinking straight. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It's just things are different. It, it is what it is. And it doesn't help, ever help to lose your patience with people because they they don't move as quickly or as efficiently as, as you might. It doesn't help to berate people for not being able to follow your simple instructions, which may not be so simple for them, especially if you're trying to give them in a, in a language that's not your first language. It, it doesn't help to get frustrated because people think differently, because it's just the way it is. And, and eventually things do get done in the end. And, and sometimes the thing that's getting done, the, the things that absolutely need to get done are the ones that you didn't even think about. In the book of Psalms, chapter 37, it says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, I believe with all my heart that God's kingdom is coming on earth. But I need help. I need help seeing that his word is making straight paths through the wilderness. I need help to avoid collapsing under the weight of unrealistic expectations for myself and what I can accomplish and for my brothers. You know, I can't see past today. And it's enough for me to know that God knows what's ahead. And I just need to walk this section of the path that lies in front of me today. And by the way, in the spring of 2000, there was a Pentecost moment for me in Bulgaria, one that was completely unexpected. God allowed me to conduct the baptism of 50 adults and children living in the Roma community of Dunavci, Bulgaria. What a blessing it was to be a part of that and to understand that there are amazing things in play beyond my wildest dreams. Next time... We're going to continue talking about culture shock and different aspects that play into it. We'll talk about ant swarms and dirt roads and, and other reminders that I don't belong here in Malawi or in this world.
because heaven is my home. We'll see you next time.